So what is microeconomics? The word micro means small, and microeconomics focuses on the behavior of individual markets and the smaller individual units that make up the broader economy. Businesses, consumers, investors, and workers. Microeconomics is distinguished from macroeconomics, which focuses on problems in the broader economy like inflation and unemployment and the rate of economic growth. Adam Smith is usually considered the intellectual forefather of microeconomics. In his classic book, The Wealth of Nations, published in 1776, Smith considered how individual prices are set, studied the determination of prices for land, labor, and capital, and examined the strengths and weaknesses of the free market mechanism. Most importantly, he identified the remarkable efficiency properties of perfectly competitive markets. Using his now famous invisible hand analogy, Smith argued that the self-interested actions of individuals actually guide market outcomes to yield great economic benefits for the broader society. While Adam Smith's keen insights will provide an important foundation for many discussions in our study of microeconomics, it is also true that in America, as well as in virtually all other nations of the world, very few sectors of the economy fulfill Adam Smith's vision of a perfectly competitive marketplace delivering goods and services at lowest price and highest quality. In fact, the U.S., as well as most other modern industrialized nations, has what is called a mixed economy. At one end of this mixed economy, we have industries like farming and mining. These industries are characterized by many buyers and sellers and come closest to approximating Adam Smith's model of perfect competition. At the other end of this mixed economy, we have pure monopolies like the post office, characterized by one seller and run by the government. In between these two poles of perfect competition and monopoly, there are numerous oligopolies, from the tobacco and chewing gum industries to automobiles and oil. Oligopolies are industries which typically have a small number of large firms, and many of America's largest industries are oligopolies much more likely to engage in collusive practices such as price fixing than the type of fierce competition envisioned by Adam Smith and his invisible hand. In contrast to Adam Smith's free market economy and America's mixed economy, a command economy is one in which the government makes all the important decisions about production and distribution. In a command economy, such as the one which operated in the Soviet Union, the government owns most of the means of production, land and capital. It also owns and directs the operations of enterprises in most industries. It is the employer of most workers and tells them how to do their jobs and it decides how the output of society is to be divided among different goods and services. Regardless of whether a country has a command or mixed economy, it still must answer three basic questions. What shall be produced? How shall it be produced? And for whom shall it be produced for? In answering these three basic questions, a country must address three basic facets of economic and political life. Scarcity, efficiency and equity. Take scarcity first. If infinite quantities of every good could be produced, there would not be economic goods, that is, goods that are scarce or limited in supply. All goods would be free, like sand in the desert or seawater at the beach. In such an Eden of affluence, people wouldn't have to worry about stretching out their limited incomes to fulfill their wants. Businesses wouldn't worry about costs and profits when they produce their products. Governments wouldn't have to tax their citizens to build things like roads and bridges. And there would be no distinction or political and economic conflict between rich and poor, because everyone would have everything they needed and wanted. Prices and markets would be irrelevant, and economics would not be a useful subject. Clearly, no society has reached such a utopia of limitless possibilities. Instead, while goods are limited, wants are seemingly limitless. Indeed, after two centuries of rapid economic growth, production in the United States is still not high enough to meet everyone's desires. And outside the United States, and particularly in Africa and Asia, hundreds of millions of people suffer from hunger and material deprivation every day. Faced with the undeniable fact that goods are scarce relative to wants, 
an economy must decide how to cope with limited resources. It must choose among different potential bundles of goods, the what, select from differing techniques of production, the how, and decide in the end who will consume the goods, the for whom. In a very real sense, then, the essence of economics is to acknowledge the reality of scarcity and then figure out how to organize society in a way that produces the most efficient use of resources. Efficiency denotes the most effective use of a society's resources in satisfying people's wants and needs. As we shall see, allocating resources efficiently is all the more complicated because in pursuing efficiency, there is almost always a very thorny trade-off between what is efficient from an economic point of view and what may be viewed as fair or equitable from a social and political point of view. In fact, grappling with the trade-off between efficiency and equity is one of the most difficult tasks of economists and the political and business leaders they serve. Consider the case of electricity prices. When we study monopoly, we'll learn that from a microeconomic view, the most efficient way to regulate electricity prices would be to charge individual consumers much more than businesses for the same unit of electricity. However, such a pricing policy creates enormous political problems because it is people, rather than businesses, that vote in our democratic system. Moreover, many would argue that it simply wouldn't be fair to charge people, especially the poor and elderly, more than big corporations for the same product. In a similar vein, we will also see that almost any time the government tries to raise taxes to redistribute income from the rich to the poor, through mechanisms like food stamps or Medicare, those taxes tend to interfere with the efficiency of the free market.